special event to mark 40 years since the ABC trials. My name is Phil Chamberlain. I'm head of the School of Film and Journalism at the University of Western England. Uh, in 1977, two journalists, Chris Mulberry and Duncan Campbell, met former intelligence corps soldier John Berry to hear his evidence uh, about government surveillance. Uh, all three were arrested as soon as they left the meeting and were charged under the Official Secrets Act. Uh, it led to a series of court hearings which were by turns partial and chilling. And it also led to a vociferous campaign, the ABC campaign that became to be known, which highlighted the political nature of the trials, the very British tradition of official secrecy and the threats to investigative journalism. Tonight's event is more than an, an historical examination of those proceedings it's, and a celebration of the, of the campaign. Uh, it should also help us understand the continuing tension between the state and democratic oversight when it comes to government surveillance, a, a tension we've seen played out time and again, perhaps most recently with Edward Snowden, and I predict we will see played out again in the future. So, next slide, please. <clears throat> And as such, it's a, a privilege to introduce tonight John Berry and Duncan Campbell and the family of Crispin Aubrey. The work of Crispin, who passed away in 2012, lives on in many ways, not least in the legacy established in his name, which helps support a bursary for aspiring journalists studying at the University of the West of England. And your donations tonight will help make sure that bursary continues. Can I also thank the Arnold Feeney for hosting tonight and the Bristol Festival Ideas for its support, Andrew Kelly from the festival, who was supported of the campaign at the time uh, we changed the first discussion panel. And on that panel, we'll have John Berry and Crispin's widow, Sue. Uh, Michael Mansfield, who was part of the defence team, is unable to join us. But we do have Bill Nash, who is John Crispin's solicitor. And we've also been joined by Jeffrey Robertson, QC, who was part of the defence team. And after the panel, we'll take a couple of contributions from people who are part of the, of the campaign. There'll be a short break, and I'm going to emphasise short, because we want to make sure we have plenty of time to hear from the people involved. And the second panel will be chaired by Sarah Kavanagh from the National Union of Journalists and will be joined by Duncan Campbell and State Watch Director Tony Bunyan. And they'll put the issue in its current context. We probably could fill the auditorium several times over, so you'll want to have plenty of questions. And after that second panel, we'll go to you for any questions you might have for the panel members. We'll finish at nine, uh, but the evening need not end there. In time on the journalistic fashion, we will adjourn to a neighbouring bar uh, to continue the uh, discussion, the reminiscences and the questions. We'll be over at uh, the Baldo Quay, just over on the other side of the river, and you're welcome to join us. And in 1977, the campaign produced many uh, t-shirts and uh, posters and badges, uh, many of which I've seen adorn people uh, tonight. Uh, this being 2017, we've got a hashtag, uh, hashtag uh, ABC40, please use that to uh, uh, tell people on social media about the discussion tonight, for those who won't be able to make it. And if there are any undercover police officers in the room, you can put away your notebooks because we'll be issuing a podcast uh, later on after this event, so just to save your time there. Um, that's enough from me. I'd like to hand over now to Christmas Daughters, Ben Kate and Rosie to say a few words, and then we'll get the first panel underway. Thank you. Um, I'm Crispin's eldest daughter and I was three when my father was arrested. Um, I've often been asked whether my experience of the ABC trial had any influence on my decision to go on to be a criminal barrister. Mm. I, I have to say, I, I, um, I ha was reminded of a memory just last year and it was when my father was arrested, um, initially he was taken to Brixton Prison, and in those days you could take food, in fact you could take alcohol into prison. And so my mum and I went off, we were living in Hackney at the time, she took, we were going off to see Daddy in prison and we took him some food. But when we arrived there, you could have food, you could have alcohol, but children were not allowed in. <laughs> um, so a very kindly security guard looked after me while my mum went and uh, saw Crispin. And I have to say, my eternal sense of injustice that not being able to see my parents is maybe something that has been the far in my belly that's driven me forward in my career as a criminal barrister. Um, so, for Dad being arrested, it gave him a sense of a window into the lives of those who were at the receiving end of the law and an empathy and a kindness and he always tried to help individuals and find a way to encourage others 
and the Crispin Aubrey Legacy Fund is, in a way, our way of trying to um, pass on those values and virtues. We also had a sense as children that we were, inst were instilled with the sense of belief that you could make a difference in the world. And even just one person against the machinery of the state, that you could have an opportunity to change things. And just looking at the Grace and Perry exhibition today, one of the tapestries on the wall, the words that were read were um, emblazoned on this tapestry were a time to fight, a time to talk, and a time to change, which seems a really poignant um, representation of what we're here to talk about this evening. Um, the Crispin Norbury Legacy Fund has been set up to support and champion both journalists and campaigners, particularly those who want to champion issues around social justice and the environment, that two issues that were very significant important to Crispin. <coughs> So, um, I think we just feel really delighted and excited that we're all here today on the back of the idea of doing, you know, setting up the fund um, in Kristen's name and just to have so many amazing and inspiring people all here together in the same room um, is really something special. And especially being brought up in a house when all these names have been talked about all these, all these years, to so actually sort of see you all here again is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about the fund, it is about supporting young, inspiring journalists, and we're very happy, um, lucky to have Holly and Michael here today, who are two of our, our latest scholars. And I guess um, tonight is a real opportunity... <laughs> My name is Andrew Kelly from Bristol Festival Ideas, and I've been asked to chair this first panel. Phil mentioned that I, was, I wasn't really involved in the campaign. It was one of the first campaigns that I became aware of. I was about to embark on a student career as, uh, in the School of Peace Studies at Bradford University, and if that was the case, you, you couldn't avoid campaigns like this, really. And it was, one of, as I said, one of the first I became aware of, and I dug out my fatal bag of student badges that I have at home, including my Peace News badge and my I Failed the Jury Vet badge, which we'll be coming on to uh, at some point. I actually didn't fail the Jury Vet because I served on a jury sometime after that, so uh, it was a, a nice gesture. So our first panel is going to look at the, the background to this, about what... Um, what's going on? <laughs> Oh, no, finished. Sorry. Um, so the first panel is going to look at the background to the campaign, about the legal uh, side of the campaign, and, and Phil's already introduced the panel. Just to remind you, we've got John Berry, we've got uh, Sue Aubrey, Bill Nash, and we've got Jeffrey Robertson. I'm going to come to you first, John, and just tell us about really how it all started and, and your your role in this. My role, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose it began for me. Um, well, as a keen as a keen time out reader in the in the late 70s um, and it was within the pages of time out that I first read about the campaign to fight the deportations of two American journalists one of whom was an ex-CIA agent Philip Agee the other of whom was Mark Hosenwald who together with my good friend Duncan Campbell um, <laughs> Sorry, just so we explain, there are two Duncan Campbells, which is going to cause all sorts of problems. At least two Duncan Campbells. Duncan and Mark had written an article about Time Out called The Eavesdroppers, which was about signals intelligence. And I was quite surprised as an ex signals intelligence operative. I'd stressed that this was like seven, seven years of land class, but I, I was impressed with the fact so much of what I had been participating in had been exposed, as it were, by Duncan and, and Mark. Um, and it seemed to me, it just struck as a vast injustice that these two Americans should be deported by an allegedly progressive Labour government. And as a consequence of that, I wrote to the AG Hosenwald Defence Committee, and I subsequently made a statement to the NCCL, which I should explain is, uh, was the predecessor of Liberty. Um, the statement I made, I reread it today actually for the first time probably 
for at least a couple of decades, and it, it, it struck me as being rather naive and, and rather inept. <laughs> and it concluded on a fairly dramatic, melodramatic kind of note that, that um, the existence of kind of quaint, the existence of a government agency spent, capable of spending vast sums of public money without any, any kind of accountability should do much to dispel any illusions about the democratic nature of our government. Now that does sound rather rather dramatic. I think that that statement eventually found its way um, to time out. And the consequence of that, I was interviewed by Crispin and Duncan at uh, my flat, our flat in Passport Hill. And immediately after that interview, um, I found myself confronted by some burly special branch policemen who burst in through the door. Duncan and Crispin had just left. Unbeknown to me, they were being escorted into a, into a police car, waiting police car. And, and the special branch came pouring upstairs and burst into the flat and said, we have reason to believe you may have committed defence under Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act, the usual sort of uh, police statement that goes along with that. And I was, I was flabbergasted. But, you know, I, there wasn't really much I could do except the company. <laughs> in fact, they took me by the arms, I think, and <laughs> escorted me out through the door into the way the police car. Now, the events that followed that were quite extraordinary because we, we drove in the police car and I said, Can you tell me where we're going? And uh, some of the front said, Yes, we're going to Russell Hill Police Station where you'll be further questioned. So I thought, OK, I sat back. Uh, the police car drove down the road through Muswell Hill Broadway, and I knew the Muswell Hill Police Station was over there. Police car was going down there, and I thought, this is a bit strange. Perhaps they've got somebody else, you know. Some other fate awaits me here. We are down Highgate Hill, and eventually it became clear that the police driver didn't actually know where Muswell Hill Police Station was. <laughs> You may find that difficult to believe, but you know, we, we, we got down to the bottom of my game, you know, and then it became evident they didn't know where they were. And one of the bright idea of getting out and hailing a passing black cat. <laughs> and he obviously said, can, can you please, and we will follow you to the police station, and he must well help, you know, and he showed his special branch car, and we turned up and we drove his tail behind this, this um, black cat, and eventually we arrived at the police station. And I felt like saying that, I regret having not said it, but I do regret that I didn't say it. I, I could have said, well, if you had asked me, <laughs> I would have gotten it. But still, that was just, you know, a little comic kind of interlude. And we duly arrived at the police station, and, um, and I think they, they, the Duncan and Christian, were thinking, have we been set up? And I was thinking, have I been set up? But eventually we got to talk to each other through the central heating pipes, I think, is that right? Yeah. We were tapping on and eventually we Shout found in. that we were all there, so at least we knew we were together. And uh, it went on from there. So I mean that's And you were you were a social worker at that stage? I was a social worker at that stage. You'd worked for SIGINT for how long? Well I worked for SIGINT I suppose for four and a half years. Right. And what did you do there? I oh, 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 oh. said I was a, 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 an analyst of special intelligence, um, but largely I was involved in trying to uh, assist in tracking down, um, well, largely Iraqi um, forces who were uh, active um, in the Middle East at the time. So, trying to put together a lot of battle with the Iraqi army and that kind of thing. It was pretty low level stuff. Um, okay, Sue, so, uh, at this stage you, you got a call, presumably, to say your husband was in jail. No, 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 I was at home on my own, well, not on my own, I had to return Kate in the street, and she was in bed, and it was about 11 o'clock, maybe a bit later, and the phone rang, and that was was the piece of saying that Kristen was there, and then Kristen came on, and um, he said, that he's okay, don't worry, but can I get the can can I get him a and then the phone's coming. 
I'm looking at the solicitor and I thought, I don't know three solicitors. Um, but actually one of them was, was Bill and I knew he worked for NCCL, so I thought, he sounds like the right sort of person. And, but then it was, you know, 11 o'clock at night and I thought, well, what should I do? I can't really mark that. And so I had sleepless nights. And in the morning, I think it was my, probably about 7 o'clock when I was waiting in order, I rang him up. And he, a, a friend in his house answered the phone. And eventually, I think Bill came on. Um, and then the next person I rang was the other guy. The other Duncan Campbell worked in the newsroom at Time Out where Crispin was. And I, I had to explain Crispin had to come home and had been arrested. Um, but we, what we have really said is that Crispin was a journalist and he worked at Time Out in the newsroom and he, he very much supported the AIDS the Hose and Ball campaign because, particularly because. Mark had actually worked at Time Out and they sat together in the newsroom. So he had said before he went out that night that he was going to this interview, which you know he hoped was going to help the Age of Hilton War campaign. But I didn't really know much about him at that. Um, so later in the day, Duncan ran back and said that they were all meeting, as it turned out, at Bill's house. And um, so I found a friend who was happy to have Kate, and Kate happened to be there because um, she liked being her friend. <laughs> and um, I arrived at Bill's house, and I don't know, there were half a dozen at least people there, and, the, and I met John's wife, or girlfriend at the time, in the and it's there that the ABC campaign began. And during the afternoon, we all went out to Lusk Police Station and shouted, <laughs> Which was very heartening for the viewers. I think you heard this. Why the commotion outside? You said you sang as well. What did you sing? You you told well, no, I think it was just singing that way. Really. Yes. I think it was just singing. And you could hear this? The... Yes, yes, yes. It was muted, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what I really wanted to say is that for the young people in this audience, that campaigning in 1977 was a completely different thing than today, because nobody had computers then. There was no website. There was no social media. So everything had to be leaflets that were delivered and public meetings. Um, we had, you know, a mailing list which is all handwritten on index cards and I think we had A4 sheets of paper with lots of dresses on which we photocopied in order to, to cut them all out to do a mailing. And no mobile phones, it was only landlines, so you had to have telephone trees if you really wanted to get people out. And I think every week the ABC campaign met in the top room of the pub, which was later far gone, it made us all quite anxious. And it was, you know, we had to involve, get involved in unions and and a lot of MPs um, supported us. And I think that all A, B, and C went to individually to a lot of public meetings just to get the word out. And, um, I mean, behind us, you, you can see various leaflets that were produced at the time, and there was Husky from the the VT, I think. Was it even VT then? You know, so, and, and, and a large dragon that used to hiss city secrets. Every court, every court um, appearance had a demo there, and even the children had the placard said, "I am five, M I five, that's and it, there was just a lot of very humorous things. But I suppose for me personally, 
I was catapulted into a world I did not understand. So there were a lot of really scary things. But on the other hand, amazing number of people did amazing things for us. And it was something that has left a very warm feeling, even 40 years on, um, that I feel I'd skip back. What I could again. Okay. Bill, I'll bring you in. You, you, you came up with the, the ABC, didn't you? Well, it was a blinding crash of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Many years of legal training. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were never intending you were home. Well, I wasn't being paid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, having said that, I mean, I think I'd just like to add one thing, which is, of course, Sue phoned me and she had my own telephone number anyway, because we knew each other previously. And um, she immediately went to my, the top of my all-time favorite partner's husband's wife's list, because she waited all night, not waking me up. <laughs> and my friend, Michael, who used to, in those days, of course, the telephones were attached to the wall, <laughs> uh, sort of cables. My friend Michael came down to see me and said, the woman on the phone says her husband's been in the police station all night and she won't go away. <laughs> um, it happened to be probably the most uh, unexpected person in my friends and acquaintances. But all hell literally broke loose that morning. <clears throat> Just coming back to the campaign issue, when we got to my house, because my issue was trying to get into the police station to find out what the hell was going on, um, we had one telephone, and everyone was sitting there, you know, desperate to be campaigning and getting the thing going. And of course, I suddenly realized halfway through, we were leaving messages for people on my one telephone line. <laughs> and we were then ringing up somebody else and leaving a message. And so it was going on. And we, the line was constantly engaged, because nobody had no phones or anything like that. And I think we had to sort of take time out and sort of allow ourselves to the time to receive incoming calls. I mean, it, these days it wouldn't happen like that. And you, you were solicitous about um, this was said to be dreadfully secret. Um, so secret that I wasn't allowed it or later Duncan Campbell's photographs of the post office tower um, and various other things without signing an undertaking saying I keep them in a burglar proof safe and I crossed out the burglar proof because they wouldn't let me have access to my one client who might have felt. <laughs> um, but, um, nobody else was allowed to see these things. They produced a transcript of this conversation which was wonderful because it had um, at the top of it it had the word secret in um, rubber stamp, and in front of it, in felt tip pen, was the word top. And I um, queried this, I was told that Scotland Yard didn't own a rubber stamp. <laughs> anyway, this was allegedly this stuff that was going to be useful to an enemy and all the rest of it that John had been talking about during the course of this conversation. And in terms of preparation to trial, I was trying to work out, well, how do you deal with this? I mean, I could go to the Russian embassy and show them and say, do you know this stuff? Um, because it was pretty clear that they probably did. Um, but I thought I might get into trouble. So uh, I thought the next best thing was to find somebody who was bona fide UK national who probably did know what the Russians knew. And there was a wonderful professor up in Edinburgh called Professor John Erickson. And so I decided I would take this up to Professor Erickson and show it to him and ask him whether it was secret or not. It seemed to me to be an obvious point. Um, but of course, I had it on undertaking that I would keep it in my verbal crusade and nobody else was allowed. Not even John Christopher were allowed to see it without me, um, my authority and presence. So I rang up the director of public prosecution and said, right, I'm going to show this to my expert. And some chap brings back, I'm probably great attention, some chap brings back and says, right, who's your expert? And I said, well, I don't really want to tell you. And they said, well, in that case, no. <laughs> so I said, all right. Reluctantly, I'll tell you, it's Professor Erickson. He's a professor of defense studies in Edinburgh. He's cleared to secret anyway um, as part of his 
job and I want chef. That comes a call from the assistant director of public prosecution. You can't show it to Professor Erickson, he's not an expert. <laughs> so I then said, right, I'm speaking to a deputy. So I said, I'd like to speak to um, the director of public prosecution, please. He's not in the office. When's he going to be there? Well, we'll check his diary. Tomorrow he's traveling. Then I said, I know it's better to travel, hopefully, than to arrive. Presumably, he's going to arrive. Can he phone me when he arrives? And we were getting very close to what in those days was known as an old town committal. We were literally the weekend before. And so um, I was told he would be able to phone me at 5 o'clock the following day. And I said, right, I'm going to be in Tony Giffords, James, Tony B. Um, one of the barristers involved, who was one of Christian's uh, representatives, and we'd arranged the conference. So I said, you can phone me there at five o'clock. Well, phone calls come through at five o'clock. Now, you, you don't normally a conference of council is sacrosanct, and nobody's allowed to interrupt it uh, under any circumstances. But the phone call came through. The chap called Hetherington along the phone wanted to speak to Bill. So um, I took the call, and I had one of the weirdest conversations I think I've ever had, because uh, he said to me on the phone, well, I'm sorry, you can't show this to Professor Erickson. And I said, well, can you kindly explain to me, please, why not? And he said, well, the security services advise me that he's not an expert. Now, you must understand there was a lot of surveillance going on at the time of which we were aware. And so I said to him, well, have the security services advised you as to what I want to ask him? <laughs> and the other end said, point taken. <laughs> so I then said, um, uh, well, we're going to have to go to court and we're going to create a hell of a fuss about this. I'm going to have to, I wasn't aware that it was a, that in legal terms, the security services dictated who was an expert. I thought that was a matter for the court, and we'll go and ask them if necessary. So he said to me, the voice of the other said, Well, Mr. Nash, can't you just tell him what's in it without showing him? <laughs> so I said, Well, you mean I can fly up to Edinburgh with this transcript, and I can sit there with the transcript on my knees and read it out to him <laughs> at dictation speed. And he said, you have no objection from me, Mr. Man. <laughs> so I ventured the suggestion that I was beginning to think that the rules of this game had been invented by Lewis Carroll, <laughs> to which he responded by saying, Mr. Nash, I think probably you and I both have very difficult clients in this matter. <laughs> I said that I responded to that by saying, well, you can speak for yourself. I'm going to have a perfect word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I'm, I'm going to bring in Jeffrey in a moment. But just John and, and, and Sue, the issue of surveillance, I mean, were you aware of being watched or... Um, you know, you talked about being chased down by five Germans and so on. You were pregnant at the time as well. Um. British Kelly and said, uh, I checked in the post, and the guy said, oh, the Romans were well, yes, as soon as we receive it, we will reconnect your phone. And I said, but it's not disconnected. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> no, it's not. Yes, it is. I'm speaking to you. <laughs> uh, and then there was a minute while he uh, consulted the book. The telephone numbers not to be not to be disconnected uh, because of security interests, and, and so uh, it was was very very obvious. I, Jeremy Hutchinson and I did Duncan's case on the assumption that our telephones were tapped, and we uh, Jeremy I don't know if you read his Jeremy Hutchinson's case history. The case gets a uh, mention, but he had an enormous sense of and we would discuss devastating 
witness the view of evidence, which I did not, not a, a slight chance. Of, uh, and of course, the next couple of days later, we get a phone call, invited to a dinner party. It just happened that a very senior leader from MI6 just happened to be sitting next to him, and I just happened to mention that uh, if there was a plea to uh, Section 2, that they could manage to drop the Section 1 charges. And of course, one of the elements of the courage of the ABC was that they didn't accept that deal. But it must have been Harry. But of course, there was a lot before that, and that came at the very end of a very brutal action in which, as the opposite counsel told me, we want to put your crime behind bars for a very long time. And that crime, of course, was Dr. Campbell, uh, who instead of being sensible and recruiting him into MI6, <laughs> put him in jail. Uh, it was absurd. I came into this case quite by accident because uh, it was a Sunday and I heard on the radio that a couple of child hunters had been arrested in Section 1 of the official, official Secrets Act. So I ran Bernie Simons, the one of the people who was the solicitor at the time, and I said, and they got Duncan at last. <laughs> and, uh, I'll stand bail for it. And he said, no, it's not that dark account. It's another dark <laughs> And you, would you act for him and try and get him back? <laughs> so, but this was so heavy, this case, that I brought in John Waterman, who uh, came in, and it was a, just imagine the scene, you're in the judge's chair, he's very upper class, judge from the south, uh, and John said, Young man of spotless reputation, <laughs> just down from Oxford. Which college? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's clear this is how filmy and all the spies got they were promoted by people to be to the college. This is how the establishment works. Anyway, it was a very, very uh, threatening situation as we came up to the committal. There was uh, going to be a, a Colonel A who was so secret we couldn't know his name. And so Colonel A appeared at the top of the magistrate's court in a horse van. This is how they did their top secret witness. And the, the star of this show, I still think it in character, Mr. Pratt, the court clerk. Very old, they've seen it all. Uh, obviously, they had a very good legal knowledge, but have never been had the money to uh, go to the bar and just give a top dispensing uh, advice on it to, to the magistrate. So he said, No, there's an open justice principle. You cannot. Uh, not disclose to the defense the name of your expert witness. Well, this was the first setback to the government to side MI5 had and six had suffered. So they went off in a half. They said, all right, we'll bring back a not so secret witness. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel B. <laughs> so that gave another horse fan with their telephone and they, Mr. Pratt, this wonderful uh, didn't demand they tell us his name, so they gave me a little Colonel Lancet Johnston, and I, I think Duncan was in the dock, and I had to show him to me, he threw back his head and laughed, he said, I know Colonel <laughs> Johnson, he's in all the magazines, he picked up a bag of regimental magazines, and showed me cartoons of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson, this top secret figure, playing a sport, being called the Don of our communications mafia. And so, uh, in, in a section that calls for constitutional crisis, uh, I said to uh, 
Johnson. Uh, when you all well know it, here you are at the Wire magazine, here you are, and Mr. Crackham, good old Mr. Crackham, said, This is the which edition of the Wire? What page of the edition of 15 of the Wire? And so I'll feel I think to the nearest line to uh, identify Colonel B. And it's in a piece used in the level of the NUJ conference that some teacher uh, scribbled his name on the stand. And uh, the police drove up from London at the time of coming in from there. And uh, then uh, the constitution practice happened when four MPs named him in the House of Commons under parliamentary privilege and we stupidly heavily to none orders from MIC tried to stop the press from publishing which was to be a terrible incursion on the historic right to freedom of the press and these uh, <laughs> one of the enemies believe it or not was Robert Kilroy Silver <laughs> and uh, I met him last year and I said to him, the man who led the exposure of Colonel B. He looked rather wounded. He said, Oh, I hope I did more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to check back what he said. My sense of all that voice said, No, you never did. <laughs> but, uh, there it was. And uh, so that Colonel B was uh, a major. Uh, in effect, and I think that showed people something odd was going on here. And the ABC campaign, which was the biggest since the Oz campaign, and I think the Oz was still uh, with John Lennon and John Peel, uh, marching to the Old Bailey was perhaps the prototype. Uh, but then on the, the first day of the trial was another. These were epic moments in our constitution. And uh, Jeremy Hutchinson came into his own because Duncan had told us the night before that he thought that they tried to do something with the Jew. Well, Jeremy laughed. He thought that was just something apparent. But he, he worried that night. This is the guy who defended George Blake, as well as Christine Keeler and Lee Taylor. And uh, he just one. And he, because he was so eminent, he got up early, went to see the, the court, the figure from the, the, the court. I said, I was just wondering what was going to be interesting in the ABC jury panel. Oh no, said the old Barry Clark, uh, not for six weeks that uh, they applied to Mr. Justice Thessinger to affect the jury. <laughs> We never heard of a jury betting. And Jeremy came back spitting chips. They betting the jury. This is unthinkable, unheard of. I had a young uh, pupil who started that day, uh, just from the MSE, called Matthew Nicol. Uh, now, sir, I do. <laughs> but he was a gangling, terrified pupil. And we sent him back to the MSE library to find some authority to, to stop this business. And he came back with the 1821 version of Jeremy Bentham's Elements of the Art of Jury Packing, one of Bentham's first book. And so with only that as our authority, Jeremy stormed down and made a most fantastic off the cuff speech in the gallery. Inspired by it was the great historian E. E. Thompson, who produced writing by Cannon. In the well of the court was a young woman solicitor who was inspired by it to produce the hand in CCL handbook on jury death. Her name was Harriet Harmon. And so all sorts of, of figures were. Involved. And then, of course, although they had had better the jury, it just so happened that the foreman of this jury, causing us a lot of trouble, he was passing notes to the judge, 
saying, I am outraged. Only three members of this jury have signed the official secrets act. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> and it turns out he was a, a member of the SAS. And he was an ex foreman of the jury. <laughs> and of course, the jury should have been discharged. A very weak judge who served in the Royal Signal Commission throughout the war. <laughs> but that uh, refused to do so. Um, we were really drunk. I mean, we, we were doing brilliant. I mean, we were hit. We had got Duncan had gotten what we call the Aeroflot map, a map of uh, ordnance sites that were issued to all civil aviation pilots, including Aeroflot. And uh, we would ask every witness who came on to say, my location is top secret, we would pass the Aeroflot map and say, can you recognize your location on this? Oh, yes, yeah, serious. <laughs> this, this, at one level in court, uh, this was but in the jury, this guy was uh, cutting up rather than the real danger. Well, the cut of long story short, Bernie Simons had an amazing house in Paddy, in which uh, part, well, I won't mention the other, but there was uh, only one of my diverse conditions. And on London weekend television, uh, Russell Harty called on Chris who had a uh, show Saturday night and um, he said there's an official secret trial going on the old baby with all of the jury is from the SAS and uh, this so elite there was pandemonium and there were threats to LWT and to Hitchens but it ended the first trial. And so we sat waiting. The prosecutor pulled out the first official secrets act trial. We made a nonsense of that. So it was a slim down. Instead of facing 30 years in prison, they were only facing 16 years. Jesse, we better pause now. Okay, well, I guess yeah. in a word, what happened? An aggressive prosecution. Ah, oh, said so the prosecutors, it's been approved by the Attorney General. And Miles Jones importantly said, if the Attorney General approves it, the Attorney General is approving it. <laughs> Go away and drop it. And I did. Thank you. Uh, for that reason. Thank you. I wanted to, we, we're going to pause in a moment to have the break and stuff, but I just want to bring in a couple of people from the audience. Um, have you got a mic there? So, have you got there? Got there. Tim from the Lever, where are you, Tim? Uh, could you just tell us about your role in this? And, uh, <laughs> very briefly. Uh, how long have we got? Very, very briefly. Well, I met John Perry in the NCCL office. I think. But the most, much more important was the campaign. At the time I was uh, working with Leather Magazine and also as a member of the National Union of Journalists working for the NUJ paper. And I'm very proud to say, as a former official of the union and an active member, that the union supported ABC all the way through to the extent of being uh, defendants in the trial that followed the identification of Colonel Johnson because the Lebanon magazine published it and then the NUJ magazine published it and then we had all the uproar at the NUJ annual conference that Jeffrey spoke about, which it was a campaign that everybody on the left got behind. And I, mean, I don't want to say any more now, but in the second half of the meeting, I hope people get a chance to say how the same kind of thing can happen again, because it didn't happen much for 20 years, but now the way I see things is it's got, it is the kind of defiance and rebellion that was behind what ABC and their supporters did will be happening again. Okay, thank you. And then, is Albert here? Albert, are you from the pictures? We go over, over here. Just, there's Mike just there. That's over there. Behind you, Phil. There. Oh, right, you've got my there. Uh, Albert, just tell us about what you revealed and how that happened. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it does show the, the problem caused by the lack of court reporting these days. 
because in fact all systems are estate agents and in those days at this particular time uh, we had enormous freedom we one of the other stories we did with Philip Davey was being printed the names of every CIA agent in London. And they were all uh, then sent back to Washington. And the American ambassador went on television to denounce us. And it was a magical time from that point of view with Mark Rosenwald and, and Kristen in the newsroom and with the enormous freedom which Time Out had and the level I had. And I think it's sad that I know it exists in, in other forms of, of the media now, but that that great source of, of um, news no longer exists in that particular form. One other thing I'd mention is, nobody mentioned that when we used to go to court, uh, there would always be a uh, crowd outside singing, who do you think you're kidding, Colonel Johnson? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we are, quite on like that, Thank you very much. Can I add just one sentence? I'm sorry. Just about, about the CIA. Just to speak one well, minute. I don't need it. No, no, you really need it. Some people the CIA can't. agents in London, we didn't pub just publish their names and addresses. We demonstrated outside their houses since we got their addresses. We printed leaflets identifying them and put them through the letterboxes of their neighbours, telling them that they were living next door to a CIA agent. Why don't people do that now?